This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are the true stories. Plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have been, for obvious reasons, changed. The stories are produced with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now you will hear from Chief Superintendent John Davidson, custodian of the famous Black Museum of Scotland Yard. Here is Chief Superintendent Davidson. Good afternoon. We have here in the Black Museum just about every kind of exhibit you or nearly anyone else could imagine. Weapons that have been used in murders are frequent. Garments worn by murdered persons or the persons who murdered them. Bloodstains, even many things more gruesome. But this exhibit is, I believe, genuinely unique. Do you recognize it? You should. It's an inspector's badge. An inspector on the CID, a genuine badge. It, too, was deeply involved in a murder case. This badge was once worn by Inspector George A. Frame. And here is former Inspector Frame himself, who I think will tell you all about how it came to be here. Go ahead, George. Yes. My old badge. Let me hold it half a second, please, John. Yes, I was very proud of that badge once. I think I still am, even though it's an exhibit here on the Black Museum now. Yes. I think I'd been moderately successful as a police officer when Sir Lewis called me, hadn't I, John? Of course. Well, Sir Lewis asked me to come to his office on an important matter, so of course I went. A very impressive man, Sir Lewis. I can hear him yet. Something of a mess down there. There's been so much in the newspapers about it and all that that we've got to get on it at once. Sit still. The whole house asked me to assign a good man. Thank you, Sir Lewis. Don't know anything about you. Here, you're a good worker. Work. That's what this will take. Work and common sense, eh? I'll do my best, Sir Lewis. Hope it'll be good enough. I'll try. I'll try, sir. Yes, sir. Dignity. Dignity is what we need. Competence and dignity. And hard work. What's your name? Uh, Frame, sir. This case you're assigned to now. Down in South Loamshire. Know where it is? Uh, Yes. Well, you'll see. Village named Ward. Odd name, Ward. I think I know... Little village. Man's young son was killed. I remember, sir. What about him? A year old. Thought he'd been kidnapped. He wasn't. Found him in the garden. Next morning. Murdered. Slashed to death. Yes, sir. I think I remember... Had this local constabulary trap on the the case for a week now. An official scoundrel. Regular Dogberry type, I'm going to understand. Village, uh, cock, fool. Uh, Well, sir, now... Done nothing. Newspapers printing all sorts of stories. Well, Scotland Yard is Scotland Yard asleep, all that. Yes, sir, I've seen... Will you stop babbling? The Home Office has been on my neck. Settle this at once, Sir Lewis. Must this go on, Sir Lewis? Get cracking, Sir Lewis. That's your job. Frame, is that it? Go on, settle it. Yes, sir. Don't but... ask foolish questions. Get down there at once and get it settled. Now, mind you, no nonsense. No friction with the local constabulary and no excuses. Well, I was just... Well, sir, all right. Ward and Loamshire. I'll be off at once. And don't come back without... Why are you standing there with that silly grin on your... Hello, hello. Yes, of course, it's Sir Lewis speaking. Get through to the Home Office at once and tell them that Loamshire matter will be settled at once. Got my best man on it. Now, now, go on, go on, go on, whatever your name is. In the village of Ward, I was conducted to Superintendent Ogle of the South Loamshire Constabulary, who was in charge of the case, and not delighted at all at being summarily replaced by an inspector of the CID from Scotland Yard. He was quite eloquent about it. I don't know what you think you're going to do with your frame. I expect to do my duty, sir. We can dispense with your fine Scotland Yard talk, young man. We have our duty, too, you know. I'm sorry, Mr. Ogle. You may address me as Superintendent Ogle while you're about it, too. I'm sorry, sir. Come in your fine London ways on me because I'm a man from the Shires. I'll expect proper respect, sir. I'll expect proper respect. I beg your pardon, sir. Why, sir, in my ballywick, you're to consider yourself no better than one of my constables, too. You're to be entirely under my orders. Do you understand that? I was under the impression, sir, that I am under the orders of the Home Office. I'll stand for no insubordination. I'm not being insubordinate, sir. I'm merely telling you my orders. Well, you're to make a fool of me. Isn't that the truth? 
No, sir. Oh, is that a fact? Well, then, what are you doing here, then? What are you doing here? The Home Office has instructed me to try to obtain a conviction in this case, sir. Oh, you're to obtain a conviction, then? I'm to try, sir. I suppose a London man knows more about it than we who live here, then. No, sir, I don't know anything about it yet. All you know is that Scotland Yard says I failed. The Scotland Yard doesn't say that, sir. Well, there's been a lot of talk, and I resent it. I resent I, it. I'm sorry, sir. Would you mind telling me something about the case? Don't you know anything about it? Well, very little, sir. How much? Only that a child has been found dead, sir. Murdered, apparently. Have you any suspects, sir? That's none of your business. I'm afraid it is, sir. Well, I don't think so. I hope that doesn't mean that I'm not to get any help from you, sir. Am I correct, sir? I'll give you what help we can. What help I have to give you. Well, go ahead, sir. What do you expect me to do? Solve this case for you and then let Scotland Yard take all the credit? I've had about enough... Scotland Yard needs no credit, sir. Well... But the case must be solved, sir. Are you accusing me of inefficiency? Not accusing you, sir. But I'm sorry, I've been sent down here by the Home Office. Do you think you're welcome here? You haven't told me what's been accomplished so far, sir. Look here now. Yes, sir. I've made an arrest today. Oh, have you, sir? I most certainly have. May I ask whom, sir? I arrested Elizabeth Wright. Well, who is Elizabeth Wright? The nursemaid at Madden's house. Madden? Oh, uh, that was the boy's name, yes. Didn't you even know that much? No, sir, I didn't. I expect to know a great deal more by the time I get back to London. And what about this woman, sir, uh, Elizabeth Wright? Uh, what did... They released her. Who did? Her magistrate. Oh? And do you know what they said to me? Uh, the magistrate, sir? They said I didn't have one scrap of evidence against her. But you did, of course, sir. Well. Well, sir? I didn't have much. Oh? She was visiting her sister when it happened. Where, sir? In Edinburgh. But you suspected her, sir? Well. What? Well, a man's bound to arrest somebody. Oh. And now they send me a Scotland Yard man. I never have any luck. <laughs> I dislike to comment unfavorably on a member of my profession, but I shall not. It does seem to me, though... Sorry. I never in all my life saw such a... In two days, going about the village of Ward, I discovered several facts. One, there had been two children in the Madden family. The dead boy and a sister. Her name was Bridie Madden, and she was the daughter of Madden's first wife, who was dead. The boy was by his second wife. Two, that there were several servants, including the nursemaid who had been arrested. A sweet, gentle, shy girl, by all reports. Three, I learned that the father, Jerry Madden, was suspected by some of the villagers of having murdered his little son. Although no one advanced any reasons why they thought so. Fourth, according to some of the schoolmates of Bridie Madden, she was in considerable fear of her stepmother's uncontrollable temper. Fifthly, that somebody unspecified would have to hang for the murder of the little boy, a conclusion with which I was fully in agreement. And sixthly, that I was the most unpopular person in the village of Ward. I was from London, and the villagers were fervent adherents of the happily disappearing maxim, here's a foreigner, let's heave a break at him. I was not encouraged, especially since Superintendent Ogle made no secret of his antipathy toward me. A little discouraging. I thought of returning to London, but I remembered Sir Lewis was there and stayed on. I visited the Madden household. Mrs. Madden was confined in a nursing home at the edge of the village. She had not recovered from the tragic death of her little son. The daughter, Bridie, was at school. Elizabeth Wright, the maid whom our village policeman had arrested, had gone back to her sister's home in Edinburgh. I was received by Ellen Perry, another servant who was not the happiest of mortals, but who talked freely. Horrible, sir. Just 
plain horrible. It's all I can say. Poor little fella. I suppose you have no ideas on the matter, have you, Ellen? Oh, Lord, love a duck, no, sir, not I. Hmm. You never did suspect Elizabeth Wright, I suppose. Oh, that fool. You shouldn't speak that way of the poor girl, Ellen. I'm speaking of Gumshoe Ogle. Excuse me. I mean... Policeman indeed, the great elf. He couldn't detect a change in the weather. That one couldn't. <clears throat> no, sir, I don't suspect anybody. Oh, Lord knows I wish I did. What about Miss Bridie? Oh, not Miss Bridie, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope you don't think I mean I suspect Miss Bridie, Ellen. I meant what does she think? Oh, well, I'm sure she doesn't suspect anybody, sir. Not Miss Bridie, the poor child. Ellen, how do you and Mrs. Madden get along? The finest woman that ever drew breath, sir. The finest, dearest woman. Poor dear, she's only got one tiny fault. Her temper. Her what, sir? Her temper? <laughs> Why, Lord, love a dog, sir, Mrs. Madden, they ain't got no temper. That's what I was saying. She lets everybody walk over her. She's got no more temper than a mangle wurzel. Well, I was told she has a very violent temper. <laughs> oh, not her, sir. Someone's been pulling your leg. Oh, excuse me, sir. Well, but why should I? No, sir, I've lived in this house ever since she married Mr. Madden, and I've never seen her raise her voice, even when she fell down the well and near drowned the will there, sir. I must be mistaken, then. Oh, you are that, sir. A sweeter woman ne'er drew breath, sir. Poor woman. Well, I'm sorry to have thought so. I mean... No, sir. Temper me I. <laughs> Not Mrs. Madden, sir. Well, I'm sorry. I did... I'm going to tell her, sir. She'll die laughing. Oh, no, please. Please don't say anything to her about it, Ellen. Please don't. <laughs> I'll keep your secret, sir. Well, thank you, Ellen. That's a good girl. Uh, who told you that, sir? Why, why, you know, I really don't remember, Ellen. Curious, sir. <laughs> well, now, who would... Yes, sir. Temper. <laughs> oh, blimey! Excuse me, sir. I went to call on Superintendent Ogle. Though it was near enough to high noon, I found the gentleman still in bed and in no very good humor at being awakened. Well, you would know. I wanted to ask you a question, Superintendent. Well, ask it. I'm sorry to wake you, sir. Oh, uh, I'm awake now. What do you want to know? Just hand me my trousers there, will you? Yes, sir. Thank you. You're getting them on backwards, sir, I think. Uh, Other way around, sir, I think. What do you want? I was wondering whether you collected any tangible evidence at all, sir. Tangible? Anything I could see? No. There wasn't anything? Nothing I considered important. I'd have told you. I'd have told you. Nothing at all, sir? Give me my shirt. Thank you. What did you find, sir? Nothing of any importance. Socks suspenders, please. Thank you. What, sir? Oh... Some rags. Rags? Hand me my socks. Thank you. Look like a nightgown or something torn into bits. Nightgown, sir? That's what I said it looked like. It had some stains or something on it. Paint, I expect. Someone been using it to clean paintbrushes. What color paint, sir? Huh? Toss me my shoes. You need not throw them, you know. Sorry, sir. What color paint? Uh, sort of dark wet. Oh, look, now I bust my shoelace. Getting a man up in the middle of the night. Oh, the run in here. No, no. Uh, oh, what did you do with the night gun? Sure, it was a night gun, sir. Well, look, something like one. What? Where is it now, sir? How would I know? Eh? I burned the nasty thing up. Oh, no. Well, it was partially burned when I found it. A bit of trash. I finished burning it up. I finished burning it up. Then it's completely gone, sir. Of course it is. What did you expect? I didn't expect anything, sir. Uh, hand me my necktie, will you? I'm afraid I don't understand a man with even the rudiments of a police education who could consciously make such a stupid error. Who knows that 
Good heavens, there were reddish-brown stains on the discarded garment, if it was a garment, in the very middle of a case of atrocious murder in which the victim had bled freely and he thought there were paint, and the thing had been wantonly destroyed. I found myself beginning to splutter as I walked down the lane toward the nursing home. I found Mrs. Madden, the bereft mother. In her condition, it was useless to attempt to talk with her. She just lay there and smiled a vague kind of smile. A man who identified himself as the proprietor of the nursing home deigned to talk with me. Yes, sir. She's been like that all the time ever since they brought her here after the poor youngster was murdered. She was such a happy woman. Now Has she, she been quiet all the time? Never opened her mouth except to cry out for her baby, sir. Nothing more? Well, what would you expect her to do, sir? Why, I understood she has a very violent temper. What? A violent temper? You're mistaken, sir, if you think so. I've known this girl since she was in swaddling clothes, and she... Oh. What? You've got her mixed up with Jerry Madden's first wife. Well, I don't know. This girl wouldn't hurt her. Yes. You're thinking about the first wife, Bridie's mother. What about that... her? Bridie? The girl's named after her mother. What about her? Why, you... She had a very violent temper, sir. Oh, she did. Didn't you know, sir, that she died in the insane asylum? No. Raving and screaming like a lunatic? She was a lunatic, sir. And an idea crossed my mind. As a matter of fact, sir... Not, not to be telling lies, but after all, you're a policeman, you won't tell anybody. She was a lunatic, and so was her mother before her. I didn't know the grandmother. Whitehall 1212, to which you are listening is compiled from actual case records of Scotland Yard. This one is true, as are all the others in this series. Only the names of the participants and the actual location are changed. Research on Whitehall 1212 comes from the chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, Percy Hoskins. And the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now, let's go on with the story. I passed Superintendent Ogle as I trudged down the road to the Madden home. He didn't answer my greeting. I walked on and deep in thought presently arrived. Ellen Perry was in the yard with a basket full of clothing for the family laundry. Afternoon, Ellen, I said. Afternoon, sir. Did you find out anything, sir? I went to the nursing home. You were right, apparently. I told you so. Did you know the first Mrs. Madden, Ellen... Friday? Friday's mother? Yes. Oh, yes, I remember her. A crazy woman. That must be the one you were thinking of when you talked about Mrs. Madden's temper, sir. Yes. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. She died, you know, when Bridie was just a little girl. Yes, I know. Well, now, will you excuse me, sir, while I get on with preparing the washing for tomorrow? Go on, Ellen. Thank you, sir. And so I had time to think a moment alone. I'd done a good deal of thinking on the way from the nursing home. But seeing the preparations for the morrow's wash day, a nightgown I remembered, a possibly blood-stained nightgown. I thought about the circumstances of the murder. The little boy had been put to bed. He was found slashed to death in the morning. Ergo, he had been murdered during the night. Right so far. Whoever had done it more than likely have splashed blood on his clothes, her clothes. There's only one person I suspected. A sneaking, unreasonable kind of suspicion. But there wasn't anyone else to suspect. The first bride had been crazy, with a violent temper. She died in the insane asylum. Her daughter had told a deliberate untruth about her mother. An untruth that would have been immediately apparent to anyone but a stranger like myself. Bridie must hate the stepmother. It's an old story. Could she hate her enough to... And 
appalling thought. The thought of a girl getting up wearing her night clothes, taking one of her father's razors and going then to the little boy's room, her white nightgown. I didn't want to think about it. I tried not to think about it. But Ogle had said he found that nightgown with the stains on it that he thought were daubs of brownish-red paint. And the nightgown had been partially burnt as if someone had tried to destroy it. Horrible thought, but... Ellen was coming back. Ellen, I said. Yes, sir? A penny for your thoughts, sir. <laughs> Ellen, how many nightgowns does Miss Bridie have? Nightgowns, sir? Yes. Why, she she used to have three, sir, but now there's only two. Are you certain, Ellen? Sir, I've been doing the laundry every week in this house since Bridie was a baby. I think I ought to know what clothes she's got. Yes. How long has this nightgown been missing? A long time? No, sir. Logs? What? It was the morning the little fellow was... was... I remember... I gathered up the clothes to be washed and all three nightgowns was there. Yes. And Bridie met me on the stairway and she was crying and she asked me to get her a drink of water. Yes. So I set down the basket and went and got her one. A and then... Then I picked up the basket and went downstairs and... When I took the things out of the basket there was only two nightgowns in it. Did you say anything to anyone? I told Miss Bridie and she said I must be mistaken and the, the house was in such an uproar, sir, and... But there was only two, sir, and there's only two now. What do you suppose become of it, sir? Oh, there's Miss Bridie now, sir, coming out of school. Where? There, there, down, coming down the lane, sir. Now, way back there. Bridie! All the way down the lane, I was rehearsing in my mind what I would say to her. And when we met her and I looked in her staring little beast's eyes, I knew what to say. Hello, Ellen. Why, what's the matter, sir? Bridie Madden, I arrest you for the murder of your brother, Damon Madden, and I warn you that anything you say... I took her to the magistrates to be heard. From the windows of the village schoolroom where we sat, I could see the townsfolk gathering angrily in the streets. I suppose I was not too surprised when the presiding magistrate told me that I hadn't enough evidence, that it was impossible at that moment to remand her for trial. They were far from convinced that the Crown had a case. But, they assured me, we will not close the case now because you have a very interesting theory that there's not enough evidence, they said. We wouldn't dare to act on such incomplete evidence at this time. We'll not write it off as closed, they told me. If you find any additional evidence, well, we'll keep the case open. And so I came away to London, with Superintendent Ogle of the Loamshire Constabulary marching beside me to the train to protect me from the consequences of my foolishness, he said pompously. I could hear the villagers' boos and catcalls from the train with the compartment window closed. I'd done my best, but I can still see Ogle standing there with upraised hand against the populace, and Bridie Madden standing alone, looking after me as if she'd like to murder me too. I went to Sir Lewis' office when I arrived in London. Come in. Oh, so you're back. Yes, sir. Come here. Yes, sir. Well. I did my best, Sir Lewis. And the fine monumental mess you made of things. Well, sir. I told you to get a conviction. I was sure I had one, sir. Rubbish. I'm sorry, Don't sir. Don't talk sorry to me, my man. You're as big a fool as that old stolen loancher. Uh, sir, that's... There's right. a bigger row raging now than ever before. Scotland Yard and the Home Office have been made fools of. I'm sorry, Questions sir. Questions have been asked in Parliament, sir. What do you say to that? I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> I still think we can get a conviction. I know I can turn up more evidence. And that girl's as guilty You'll as... turn up no more evidence. Why not, sir? Because you've done enough to disgrace us all, and I'll have no more of your blundering. I demand your resignation, Inspector Fred. So that's why I'm a greengrocer today. Come and see me if you are needing anything in my line. 
Goodbye, John. Goodbye, Inspector. George Frame didn't tell you the end of the story. This all happened several years ago. One year ago, I was told that a Miss Bridie Madden wished to see me. She came in. Miss Madden? Yes, sir. Do you know me? I've heard your name. In Ward, in Loamshire, several years ago. Yes. Yes. I'm graduated from school now. And lately I've fallen in love with a young man. He's a clergyman. An Anglican priest. A man of God. Yes. We were to be married. Yes. But my conscience... Why don't you say yes? You say yes to everything. I know nothing about your conscience, young woman. I told my secret... I told my fiancé everything. Yes? I wanted to confess. <laughs> I told a man of God, the man I was going to marry. <laughs> what did the man of God say? He told me to come to the police with my confession. I murdered my brother. And so we took her back to the magistrates with her confession, which she freely made. She'd never been tried. The case was still in abeyance. So Bridie Madden was at last brought to trial. She was found guilty and sentenced to be hanged. The sentence was afterward changed to life imprisonment, and justice was done. But George Frame is still a greengrocer. He handles a, an excellent line of Brussels sprouts. This is the badge he used to wear. Here today on Whitehall 1212, Lester Fletcher as Inspector Frame. Others in the order of their appearance were Harvey Hayes, Carl Harbour, Guy Spall, Patricia Courtley, Evan Thomas, and Beulah Garrick. Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs>